It's a great honor for me to speak after Mr. Passera. I think that the change in government last November in Italy was a tremendously positive development. It was extremely positive for Italy. Mr. Passera outlined the policies that they're going to follow, which are uh, a big improvement over the ones previously because there wasn't much growth previously. And hopefully we will now get that. I think also, though, it was a tremendous positive development for the Eurozone and the EU as a whole because the government now in Italy brings a sense of sanity and discourse which is much better than it was before in the whole European Union. Now, I'm going to talk about the crisis. Uh, this is a, based on work with Victor Nagai, who graduated last Monday from Wharton. And the title is, In What Form Will the Eurozone Emerge from the Crisis? Now, the headline story in the internet version of uh, the European edition of the Financial Times this morning is about a speech that the British Prime Minister, David Cameron, is going to give this afternoon. And apparently what he's going to say is that the Eurozone is heading for disaster unless it makes a move to quickly go towards full political and economic union. Now, my own view is that I don't think we're ready for a full economic and political union in Europe yet. People still think of them first and themselves first and foremost as being French or Italian or Spanish or whatever country they come from. Now, I think maybe in 20 to 30 years' time, people may start thinking of themselves as being Europeans first and then the country that they come from as their second identity. But I'm much more optimistic than Mr. Cameron about the survival of the Eurozone. I think that the way that events are developing, the Eurozone is changing in a very positive way and it's putting in place the mechanisms it needs to survive in the long run until in 20 to 30 years' time, we can fully implement a complete fiscal and monetary union. Now, when they originally designed the Eurozone, they realized that there would be an issue about fiscal responsibility. And so they put in place the Stability and Growth Pact, which had rules about what governments could and couldn't do. Now, the two major rules were to do with government finance, and they required that the deficit to GDP ratio must be close or under 3%, except for crises times. Government debt, the ratio that they allowed for that was 60%. Now, they also had a number of other restrictions on inflation rates, exchange rates, and long-term interest rates, which countries had to satisfy in order to join the euro. But it's those two that are the most important. Now, what this graph shows is the three years prior to the start of the Eurozone, and it's the government surplus or deficit for those three years. The blue is 1996, the red is 1997, and the green is 1998. Now, you can see that countries made big efforts to get their deficits under the limit. Greece moved down, Italy also, and Belgium too. By the time we got there, countries were either very close to the 3% or underneath. Now what this shows is the gross government debt to GDP 
for, again, the three years prior to the entry of the Eurozone. Now, three countries stand out as not satisfying it there. Belgium, which at that time had over 120% to start with. Greece, around 100%. And Italy, also at around 120%. Clearly, they weren't satisfying the obligations of the Stability and Growth Pact. So what they did was to change it so as long as you were moving in the right direction, then things would be okay and you could join. Now, Greece, because of, of the problems it had, the notion was that they would have to delay. So instead of joining in 1999, they joined in 2001. Now, if we take a longer term view, what, what was happening? Well, these are three countries that are the poster childs for fiscal rectitude in the current environment at that time. And we can see that Ireland, Luxembourg, and Finland all went from to, to strong surpluses as the date of the start of the euro occurred. Now, Luxembourg, we won't talk much about them again. They have a fantastic record and have always satisfied the Stability and Growth Pact. Here we have Belgium, Germany, Spain, Netherlands, and Austria. Now, you can see that Belgium, they had a deficit and they got it in, in, in under control. And most of the countries did. Now, the interesting one is Germany. Germany is the red line. Because of the reunification, they had to run deficits in the 1990s. They got that under control and got to a surplus by 2000. But then you can see that their deficit went below the minus 3%. So they were in violation of the Stability and Growth Pact. If we look, Greece, France, Italy, and Portugal, Greece clearly has a problem. It's been in violation most of that period up to 2007. The other interesting one here is France, which also violated the surplus restriction of three, minus 3%. Three they also went to 4%, and we'll come back to that in a minute. We look at government debt over this period. This is Belgium, Greece, and Italy. You can see that Belgium did a very good job of bringing its debt down. Greece did not do such a good job. Italy, like Belgium, brought it down. Here we see Ireland, Spain, Netherlands, and Finland. They all did a good job of coming below the, the 60%. Now here, we see Germany and France again. And what you can see is that they were under the 60% to start with, and they drifted up. And then, as we went into the early 2000s, they went farther above. That's when they were running these deficits. So again, France and Germany broke the rules. Now, as they broke the rules, the commission started to implement the procedures in the Stability and Growth Pact, and they started to ask them to make adjustments. Now, Germany avoided a formal excessive deposit procedure by making an agreement with the Commission, but the Commission did bring an action against France. Now, in November 2003, they presented the evidence to the Council of um, Finance Ministers. And at that point, the French and the Germans undertook political moves to persuade the other members of the Council not to impose penalties on them. And that was really, a, a, in my view, a big mistake because it reduced the effectiveness of the Stability and Growth Pact. So they, in fact, ended up suspending the pact, and no country was penalized. France and Germany weren't penalized, and none of the other countries that had violated temporarily. 
2005, they reformed the pact, they loosened the escape clauses, they lengthened the deadlines, and they ex allowed longer adjustment periods. Now, if we go back before the 2007 crisis, all the countries except Luxembourg and Ireland vi violated the 3% deficit rule. Now, a number of countries, as we saw, including France and Germany, also violated the 60%. But again, no countries were penalized for violations. Now, clearly, the convergence criteria, the fact you had to meet them to get into the euro, meant that countries did change their fiscal acts, and they got much better situations. But once the euro was established, that pressure effectively diminished, and there are studies which show that there doesn't seem to be any marginal effect of the Stability and Growth Pact if you compare these countries with other OECD countries. Now, once the crisis started, and of course we were in exceptional circumstances, and most countries violated both rules. Now, interestingly, there are currently only four countries in the EU that fully satisfy the Stability and Growth Pact criteria. Estonia is one of them, Luxembourg is another, Finland and Sweden. Now, of course, Sweden isn't a member of the Eurozone, so we just have those three. Two other countries currently satisfy the criteria. They didn't until recently, and so they're still under excessive deficit procedures, and that's Bulgaria and Denmark. So, it seems that you either have to be a rich Scandinavian country or you have to be a former communist country if you're going to satisfy these criteria. The important point, though, is hardly any of the countries satisfy it, and yet no countries have been penalized. So, just to summarize, the Stability and Growth Pact, I think, is a very good idea. The political mechanisms haven't worked very well. And I think, you know, it's important to have them there, but I don't think we can rely completely on that. Now, what about the market? So, economists love the market, and, and how did it do in this period? Well, here we see the period leading up to the Eurozone, and you can see that there was tremendous variation in interest rates across Europe. Now, by the time we got to 1999, they had pretty much converged. Now, from 1999, with the exception of Greece, which is the red line, remember they didn't join until 2001 because they didn't satisfy the criteria well enough in 1999. But since that period, what we've seen is very tight spreads. 20, 30, 40 basis points was the biggest spread between the different countries' bonds. Now, we often talk about efficient markets and how good markets are at predicting the future, but one of the very interesting things is they didn't predict the future in this case. Many people remarked on the fact that it was quite interesting that Greece had a 20 or 30 basis point differential to German Bunds, but the belief was that that was okay. Now, as we can see, what's happened since 2009 is we've seen a big divergence, not quite as much as we had before, but a significant difference. So the market didn't work, and I think one of the issues there is why not. I think what happened is that they believed the official sector that there was no chance that anything bad could happen. And also this was a very, much of this was what the period the economists call the great moderation, and things were working fairly well for much of it. Now in 2011, they introduced some more reforms. This is colloquially known as the six pack. I'm not sure how many Europeans know exactly what a six pack is, but nevertheless, that's what it's called. And this is EU secondary law, so it's law that they pass in Brussels, which applies to the uh, 
EU. And this has various components of fiscal policy. So they strengthened the budgetary surveillance, they speeded up and clarified the implementation of the excessive deficits procedure, and so on. They also were worried about macroeconomic imbalances because it isn't just fiscal prop profligacy that's the problem. And arguably in Greece, that's the issue. But if you think about Ireland and Spain, these are countries which were extremely good in terms of the stability and growth pact. And yet they had these big shocks and got into trouble. So the part of the six pack is to monitor macroeconomic imbalances. They also introduced sanctions and penalties that were larger than before. They changed the way the decisions were made about that. So before the council, ECOFIN had to vote positively to impose sanctions. Now if the commission recommends sanctions, they have to vote it down. So it goes ahead unless there's a majority against it. That's called this reverse qualified majority voting. And we'll see how that works. The macroeconomic imbalance procedure, unfortunately, is taking something of a long time. They introduced this mechanism. They just released a few weeks ago the first alert mechanism report based on 2010 net indicators. Unfortunately, the crises move much faster than this. Then we have the Fiscal Compact Treaty. And what that is, again, is more of the same. Now what countries have to do is to put a balanced budget rule in their constitution. They have to then, if they go above 60%, start moving towards the 60% at 1 20th per year. And then if you're in excessive deficit procedure, you have to put in a plan with, with the commission. Now, the problem is that the Stability and Growth Pact didn't work. No countries were penalized. And what the current strategy is, is to do more of the same, but have more penalties and so on. But I think we need more than that. As I say, I think these are, are good moves, but they clearly aren't enough on their own. And I think the basic problem is that the shocks are much, much larger than people expected when they designed the Eurozone. As I said, we were going through a period known as, by macroeconomists as the Great Moderation. We didn't see big recessions. We didn't see big macroeconomic problems. And so the kind of things that happened in Ireland and Spain with massive bubbles and then fiscal problems were not anticipated. And the problem is that the adjustment within the Eurozone, particularly for many countries which have wage adjustment which isn't very fast, which have income distributions determined in a, in a fairly centralized manner, they don't adjust quickly. And that's what's caused a lot of the problems that Mr. Passero was talking about earlier. And you know, Spain is, is one example here. It has got this very high 24.4% unemployment rate, and perhaps most distressing of all, 51.1% among youths. And that is the real problem, I think, that we face in Europe, that we need to do something about that. Now, what alternative strategies are there out there? What else can we do? Now, one of the things that we could do is to have transfers between countries. Now, at the moment, what we have is loans. The bailouts are loans. They are expected to be paid back with interest. But one way of doing things would be to have transfers. Spain, for example, through no fault of its own, had this massive bubble. I don't think people there were doing anything that was wrong. It just got caught up in an economic tsunami. So maybe we could have a transfer from countries which weren't as badly caught up and help Spain through it. 
Now, the problem is that we don't have full political and economic union. We aren't willing, particularly in the AAA countries, to have transfers of that kind. So I think that will come in 20 to 30 years, and that would be a good thing. It's a way of ensuring against these very extreme shocks. And of course, we have that somewhat in the US. We do have a federal system which transfers across states. If California ever goes bankrupt, though, I will never vote for a government that transfers money from the federal government to California. If it's Mississippi or Arkansas, that's fine. But the rich ones, we don't, shouldn't be transferring to them. Now, what are the alternatives? Well, what Victor and I suggest is we need two mechanisms, which when countries get into very desperate trouble, will help them get out of these. Now, it's interesting because I think both of these mechanisms are beginning to come about. The two are sovereign default within the Eurozone. We've seen that. We had that in March with Greece. Contrary to many people's predictions, it wasn't a catastrophe. In fact, it went through very smoothly. There wasn't much drama. And the reason for that, I think, was it was widely anticipated. And I think the second one, which is also important, is to have temporary, and I want to stress the word temporary, exit from the Eurozone. And then, once a country has recovered economically, started growing, it can re-enter when it satisfies the Stability and Growth Pact criteria. And I think what this would do would be to add to what the official sector has come up with, the treaties and so on, and it would allow the market to provide incentives to countries. Although markets haven't done a great job in the last 10 years in predicting what's happened, I think they're very quick learners and people will start to monitor the fiscal policies and the macroeconomic balances much more carefully. So as I said, sovereign default worked pretty well with Greece. The unfortunate thing was they didn't do it soon enough. If in May 2010 they defaulted the same way on the private sector, they would have limited about 75% of the debt burden. They would have had a real chance of growing out of the problem. Now, that's what the IMF usually does. Unfortunately, I think the politics, DSK was already thinking about the French election, and so they didn't force that on the EU, and I think that's a pity. But I think this is a useful mechanism to have if a country has a big shock through no fault of its own, then this is one way of getting back to a growth situation more quickly. So for example, at the moment, I think Ireland will get through this, but it would be a help if they could default on the senior bank debt. At the beginning, the ECB said, no, no, don't do that, it's gonna cause catastrophe. But these defaults in Greece haven't done that, and I think it would be the same in Ireland. They wouldn't, and Ireland would have a lower debt and it would have a, a, a somewhat better chance of, of getting out. But as I say, I think they have a very good chance of emerging. Now, temporary exit from the Eurozone. I think that in some countries, we have this desperate problem of unemployment and particularly youth unemployment. And the wages aren't adjusting. If anything, wages in many of these countries with high unemployment are still going up and creating less competitiveness. Now, I think the initial view was that austerity, problem, austerity policies would solve the problem because if you cut government spending, increase taxes to put governments back in balance, then that would show that the long term was okay and the country would start growing. And the economists, the macroeconomists, had models which had market clearing, which showed that that would be happening. Unfortunately, that's not the way it's turned out. In some of these countries, and Greece is the most prominent example, the austerity is simply making things worse. As you cut government expenditure, the economy shrinks and government revenues go down and so on. Now, it's very interesting 
there are many growth strategies, and these are structural reforms of the kind that, that we've been discussing in Europe for a while. They tend to take a while, though. Things like market reforms take a few years. Edu uh, labor reforms take a bit longer. Education takes even longer than that. Now, the one policy which does usually provide growth is a long change to the exchange rate. Argentina is the classic example of this. Argentina had a fixed exchange rate with regard to the dollar, and you can see that they started to go into a recession in the late 90s, and that got pretty bad in 01. They then dropped the peg to the dollar. They shrunk for a few more months, but then they started growing and growing very quickly. And they've grown at about 8% since then. They're now up to about 60% above where they were a decade ago. And they soon passed where they started. So in the two or three years, they were above where they started. Now, you may say, but don't they fix the inflation numbers in, in Argentina? Well, my understanding is they do at least a little bit. But even if you measure in terms of US dollars using market exchange rates, you get a similar kind of phenomenon. Now, people say, well, Argentina was different. It was a growing world economy. So what are some other examples? Well, if you compare South Korea and Japan, what you see is that South Korea with an exchange rate adjustment during the crisis, despite having an economy very much like Japan, managed to start growing pretty quickly. Japan, because it's a safe haven currency, didn't have that luxury, and they aren't above where they were in 2007. They're still about 3 or 4% below. So this is South Korea. You can see the blue line is GDP. They got badly hit after Lehman but the exchange rate adjusted, then they started growing. They're now about 15% above. Japan, if you look, they're still not where they were. As I say, they're about 97, 98%, even today, five years later. What are some of the other countries? Well, if you go back to the 1990s and look at the crises then, many countries followed this strategy of default and depreciation of the exchange rate and had long periods of high growth. South Korea at that stage did the same thing. They had a very sharp recession. But that lasted for about a year or two, one to two years, and they started growing. They've grown at 6% a year since then. Indonesia, its banking system was devastated. Most banks basically collapsed. They then defaulted and had an exchange rate adjustment, they started growing at 5% for about the same for nine years or so. Russia, same kind of thing, 7%. Now, people often say that, for example, if Greece was to follow this strategy, then it wouldn't be as successful because it has a low GDP to, uh, sorry, low exports to GDP ratio. But many countries have expanded that and been very successful. So, for example, India, even without an exchange rate, had its exports to GDP ratio double in the 1990s and then again in the 2000s. It started from a place not that different from Greece's. The gold standard. There's a nice paper by Barry Eichengreen and Jeffrey Sachs in the mid-80s, and what they argued was that, in fact, the Countries that left the gold standard in the 1930s did pretty well. It's the same effect. They were able to get over the effects of the Great Depression and start growing. Now, the popular wisdom is that it was a beggar thy neighbor policy, but that what they argue is that although there was a negative effect on those countries around them, it may well have been worse if they hadn't done the exchange rate change. And their conclusion is that more devaluation would have helped us get it through the Great Depression more easily. My view on this is the basic problem is that relative prices are wrong. If we can adjust those, then we can do much better and we can 
improve things substantially. Contagion, this is the big problem. This is what the official sector says. You know, if we do these changes, we're going to have these terrible problems of contagion. With the Greek default, we didn't because people anticipated it. I think the same thing is true currently with the possible exit of Greece from the Eurozone. Investment bank reports are putting about a 75% probability on that. Everybody's beginning to take actions to hedge against those kinds of risks. If Greece leaves, it will be somewhat chaotic, but just like countries leaving the gold standard in the 1930s, we can cope with that. And the big thing is that within a year or two, I believe Greece would start to grow again, and it was the best and most effective policy for solving these terrible unemployment problems, particularly among youths. And as I say, it's temporary. There's no reason why they can't go out in five, 10 years, whatever time it takes them to get back to economic health to rejoin. So let me conclude. I think the moves that we've seen are very positive, but they're not enough. We need to go farther. And in particular, when we have very large shocks, we need to have a mechanism that allows countries to start growing again quickly. And I think with those, we will see the euro survive. As I say, they're coming about, and I'm very optimistic about the future of the year. I think that we can keep it on track, and in 20 to 30 years, we can go towards the full political and economic union, but at the moment, it's a little premature to do that. Let me stop there.